All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to another episode of the Remarkable Coach Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Michael Pacheco, and joining me today is Darren Canthal. Uh, Darren is an avid mountain biker and snowboarder, lover of live music and great food, proud papa of a 15-year-old cattle dog mix named Marvin. I love that. Uh, in his spare time, he works with industry leaders to gain more confidence, find their voice, and thrive in their career and life. Darren, uh, welcome back to an encore presentation of the Remarkable Coach podcast. I know this is your second time coming back on. I appreciate you making time. Thank you. Yeah, man. Um, so the last time you were on the podcast uh, was June 7th, 2022. We're recording this on June 26th, so it's been almost exactly a year. Um, real quick, for those of our listeners and viewers who have not had a chance to go back and listen to that first episode, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself in your own words and, and what it is you do and why you do it? Yeah, big question. Um, so uh, born and raised in New York. I'm the oldest of three. My mom is a retired teacher. My dad passed away in 97, which is uh, the unfortunate distinction of me being alive more with him being dead than not. Hopefully I said that right. Um, he died in 97 of cancer. Um, when he died, I took over his business. So my first job out of college was being an entrepreneur, which is a pretty cool, uh, I guess, bottom piece of bread of my life sandwich. Um, <laughs> Cause I started my, uh, or maybe the career sandwich is uh, I started my career as an entrepreneur um, when I left the business and I had good reason to do so. I, I made my way to human resources and I was there for almost 20 years. So everything in terms of hiring, termination, professional development, succession planning, learning and development, all these things that are core to HR uh, turned out to be my training ground for being a leadership coach because most of what I taught the people about today are their careers. Mm -hmm. And really the three main topics that I hear from most people is uh, related to leadership style or philosophy. Like what is their style? What is their philosophy? Communication style or communication in general. And most often it's about how to disagree respectfully, um, how to say no to people, how to manage up. And then the last is conflict resolution. And that's certainly tied to communication and leadership for that matter, but specifically how to engage in meaningful debate and work towards win-win situations. Um, what I talk about too is the overarching umbrella is all about confidence. A lot of people lack the confidence to take the action and what they need is help figuring out what to do, what to say. And the more they do it, the more confident they get and hopefully they become self-sufficient. Nice, nice. Uh, good stuff, man. I mean, let's just, you know, uh, cut right to the, the, the thick stuff. What's, what's new, man. What's new in the past year. It's, it's been a minute since we, since we chatted publicly anyway, I know you and I have, have made some time to chat privately, but what's, what's new in your business. What's new in coaching? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to answer it this way and, and you keep me honest if I'm too off base here. So the first thing just to mention real quick is when I went through my coaching certification program, um, it was astounding the amount of self-coaching that happens, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're being taught all of these theories and concepts and practices, and it's really impossible. Well, it was for me at least mm -hmm. not to process these learnings through my own life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it was really sobering and sombering, if that's a word, uh, <laughs> somber is right. Um, but really to like live life through these lessons was really remarkable. Mm -hmm. Um, right now I've been a coach five years and, you know, I talk to people all day, every day and hear challenges and successes. And, you know, the, the analogy I always use is I'm in the car with you and I, I'm more times than not sitting shotgun as you're driving. And, uh, so I'm involved and, uh, all that is to say is there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I was going to say noise, but that has a negative connotation. That wasn't my intention, but a lot of talking, a lot of stuff, a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. And I did a silent meditation retreat last November. And I don't know if you've ever done it or anybody listening has ever done it, but man, to be silent for seven days when you never silent, man, crazy, crazy. <laughs> so that was new for me. And, uh, and sorry, just to, to kind of bring it into the question is it really taught me to be aware of my thoughts, how much I'm judging, um, mm -hmm. how present I am 
and bringing that to my practice of exactly what I'm saying is there are times, quite frankly, that I'm judging clients. Yeah. And as I'm judging the client, I am certainly not present because I'm too caught up in my own thoughts. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not exercising curiosity, which is one of the things that um, I'd like to say I pride myself on, but at the very least, I lean into being curious. And um, you know, coming out of their retreat, I, w- I I feel like I was improved in those areas of being mindful, less judgment, more curious. That's awesome. Um, I, I want to stick on that, man. Silent meditation retreat for seven days. I uh, I'm an only child, and, and so I you know I spend a lot of time alone in silence (laughs) (laughs) seven days is a long time even for me um how 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 did how did you what was it like what was the i'm very curious to know what it was like on the ramp up like I'm, i'm guessing throughout that seven days right you're you're going like this and this and then at some point maybe there's a tipping point where it's like all this stuff starts coming up and and you start um, you know, I guess for lack of a better phrase, learning about yourself or learning about things. What was, well, talk us through a little bit of that journey. It sounds yeah. fascinating. All right. So, uh, first I didn't have any major ahas. So okay. I didn't solve world peace or world hunger, anything like, like no real big ahas, but a lot of little stuff yeah. that like for 60 days after the retreat just kept on trickling out. And that was really remarkable. Um, the trip was in Baja. So I was in this really beautiful location. We kayaked from shore to three different uninhabited islands. We lived in a tent. Um, we had guides that did all the cooking and all the support and all the stuff. So just to set the setting, right? We're on the water, we're in on the beach. And it, not really the beach, it was very rocky. Um, we meditated, I don't know, three, four, five hours a day, which yeah. is not my thing. It's I've never done anything like this. And as dumb as this sounds, my real goal was to be present. And what that meant for me was I knew my brain was going to wander. And when it wandered, what did I do with it? Right. There were certainly some times where I was like, uh, I would curse, but I won't like, uh, I'm tired of this meditation. I want to stop on board. Mm-hmm. And then undoubtedly all, not all the times, but more times than not, a bird would fly by a crab would walk up on the beach. Um, the waves would crash or, you know, trickle onto the beach and I'd watch the sand change colors as it went away. And so that idea of being present was really looking around and observing what was all around me. Yeah. Um, so that was one thing Two is I kept a journal and a lot of songs kept on going through my head. Uh, so I haven't made the playlist of those songs, but I wrote them down. Um, I had like, I wrote a blog about it and I really came up with like all these things that were required for to, to the, for that um, retreat to happen, where like you needed support. Um, we needed the guides that had all the equipment and all the knowledge and all the stuff. Um, you had to put your, your sense of safety into these men that were going to keep us safe, which they did. They made a, a really big decision on the last day of, of not kayaking back to shore because it was like a two or three hour kayak because it was too choppy. So we all got in the boat and they boated us back. Huh. Um, you know, so it was, there was all these conditions to make it so. But um, I think more to your point in the question of like the brain stuff is there's just a lot of thought. Um, I don't think I was void of thought often, which I know is real intention of meditation, um, sometimes I was just sitting there looking around and observing and other days I was closing my eyes and really trying to get into it. Interesting. Yeah. I wonder how much of the, do, do you meditate like in your normal everyday life at all? In, in very small doses, like two to yeah. five minutes at a time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have to, I have to wonder. So I, I'm trained in transcendental meditation, which you're supposed to do twice a day for 20 minutes each time. So 40 minutes a day. I I also don't do that as often as I maybe could. Um, But I have to wonder, you know, at at the the idea that meditation is just being devoid of thought. Mm. I, I, I like it. I like it better. And I think it makes it. It certainly makes it more accessible. And I also think it makes it makes a lot of sense to just 
be present, right? And that's and it's you can be present and and be thinking about things. The birds that were flying by, the crab that was walking up the beach, right? I mean, that's not like you're not devoid of thought, but you're also you know you're not uh, you're not stressed out about the past or anxious about the future, right? You're you're very much like in that in that moment and 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 able to process what's happening directly in front of you, which I feel like is a more useful approach to meditation, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. And I would, I would add that, um, I don't know what modality I'm, I'm not even trained, but I'm familiar with is a strong focus on our senses, uh -huh. right? So recognizing the tingle in my shoulder, cause I got a knot back there or God, my jaw hurts. And I know that means I'm anxious. Uh -huh. And maybe that means I explore what I'm anxious about. Uh -huh. Or maybe I'm just sitting there and, you know, I hear the, the noise of the air conditioning come on and, you know, my dog is upstairs while I'm in the basement. I hear the creak of him walking or whatever. Yeah. And so the, the way I was taught was a focus on senses uh -huh. and, um, I love it a and B it really is a, made me attuned to the physiological responses I give myself when, yeah. I'm angry or anxious or fill in the blank. And it usually, well, I shouldn't say it usually. When I'm aware of the physiological response, it cues me or clues me into whatever's going on. And I've noticed that when my chest is tight, if I stop to explore why, it usually gives me an answer of something that I'm irritated by before I blow up, lose my temper, and then have to apologize for my actions. Right. So again, right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's important, I think to you know take this this thing that can be a little esoteric and difficult to approach and make it practical right yes. um one of my one of my favorite film directors uh that, that you've all probably heard of david lynch um he's big into transcendental meditation and what he uses it for is to come up with ideas and he calls he calls it what does he call it like you know fishing getting the getting the big fish Right, you go deep, you go deep, but he doesn't. Again, not devoid of thought. He's looking for ideas in there, um, and and paying attention to things, and and you know, kind of following weird trains of thought until he finds a big idea. Um, I I love that. I also heard on I want to say it was maybe the either the Ben Greenfield podcast or maybe Tim Ferriss. Um, there was a guy on there, and I don't remember his name, but he called it. Uh, instead of meditation, I think he called it thinkitation. Hmm. And he would um, just, you know, sit in in a chair and and have a little notebook and and he would meditate. And then whenever he had an idea, he would just jot it down. Um, and he uh, he claimed that that's that was one way that he would solve problems is thinkitation. <laughs> I mean, makes perfect. You know, it's, I'm glad you mentioned Tim Ferriss. He, he, his interview with Jack Cornfield from however long ago, many, many years ago now, like five or eight years ago is the reason I even, well, I shouldn't say the reason it was an influence. It was an influence. It was an influence of me going. Yeah. Um, my first instructor in, in coaching said he was going on the same retreat I went to. And so it was in my head. And then I listened to Ferris interview Jack Cornfield and they were talking about silent retreats and I was like, all right, this is my sign. I should go do this. Nice. Nice. Yeah. That's something. Yeah. I would like to do that at some point. I've never, never tried anything like that. Seven days is a long time. Man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the saving grace for me is this was on location, right? Like if it yeah. was in a, um, uh, what they call it, a Zendo, uh -huh. or like a, like a meditation place. I don't know that I would have had the fortitude, <laughs> You, you but, couldn't do that in your office. No, hell no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm watching these seagulls glide across the, the air, like this far from the water, you know, like it looked like an inch away from the water. And like, this is happening all day long. And so uh -huh. my, my, uh, you know, my sense of wonderment and, and short-term uh, focus was well taken care of with all of these real things happening around you. Dolphins, whales, oh. birds, fish. It was, it was amazing. That's cool. That's cool, man. Um, sweet. Well, so what, uh, what, what else has been going on since, since last year, since last we spoke? Yeah. So, I mean, business wise, um, business is good. You know, 23 is a little bit of a down year compared to 22 and, uh, it's okay. 
Um, I'm looking to the left here where my goals are. And over the last few years, I've gotten into the habit of titling the year before I do my goals. And this year I wrote, this is the year of the fine art of refinement and expansiveness. And uh, it's a lot of what I'm doing. Um, okay. I'm trying to refine what I do, who I do it for, how I speak to it. Um, the expansiveness is you know, not getting my sucked into something that's so narrow. And I'm not talking about niche per se, but um, I do better with what I describe as guardrails, right? I mean, everybody, a lot of people, a lot of people call guardrails, guide, whatever, right? It's like, what are the parameters or the boundaries in which I'm playing in? And once those boundaries are defined, I get to play wherever I choose uh, or we get to play wherever we choose. And so that expansiveness was trying to be mindful of what are my boundaries? What are the guardrails? How, how am I playing within them, but not playing small, playing big. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Are you familiar? There's a book, uh, um, the, the author's plural, I believe, escapes me, but it's a, called A Beautiful Constraint? No. Okay. So it's it's a book of essentially about guardrails and how these, you know, if you're generally speaking, if you're given, um, if you're given all the breadth in the world to do absolutely anything and whatever you want, you will create uh, let's just say, let's create less than you would if there were constraints placed upon you. Because the, the very act of having guardrails or having constraints, um, the very act of having a constraint on, on whatever it is you're trying to, to solve or create forces you to become more creative, to, to build something around that constraint, to work with that constraint. Um, to you know, break through the constraint, whatever whatever the case may be. It's a it's an interesting book. It's a beautiful book. It's it's not a exactly a, a picture book, but it's very well designed, and the the stories in there are I highly recommend it. Yeah, I think I think uh, if 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 the guardrails is a is a thing that you're kind of focused on in 2023, a beautiful constraint. I would recommend you check it out. It's a good one. I love it. Totally resonates, and I'll, I'll tell you this quick story if I can. Yeah, um, I, I've shared so I've shared this with with people that I'm coaching, and also sometimes in front of the room when I do facilitation, which is, uh, and if anybody listening knows the facts of the story, keep me honest here, and you too, please, Michael. Is so the story I was told was some scientists, if you will, social scientists, took a bunch of let's say eight year olds and uh, put them in a field with their teachers. They were safe and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Mom and dad said goodbye, left. And the kids were in this wide open field with no guardrails, no boundaries. Mm -hmm. And what they found was the kids mostly played close to each other. Mm -hmm. Like no one really wandered off or got too far away or any of that stuff. Okay. One, they did a second experiment, same kids, same thing. Parents came, said goodbye. They were well cared for teachers, watched them. But this time they were in a field that had guardrails, barriers. Uh -huh. And the way it was told to me, it was, it was fencing. And what they found was that because the kids knew they couldn't get outside the fence, they played everywhere. So those constraints or those boundaries created a sense of safety. They knew uh -huh. they couldn't get lost. They weren't going to get you know too far away from their friends, et cetera, et cetera. And so as you talk about the constraints, and I'm telling this story, in my head, they're making perfect sense together. Uh -huh. And what I find is in my work with leaders and coaching them is a lot of times the constraints or the barriers or the guardrails are unknown. So they don't know how, wh where, where did their, where does their decision-making authority end? Huh. Um, where does my job end and your job begins? Uh, am I allowed to fire this person or am I not? Can I put them on a pip? Can I not? Like mm -hmm. all these things of what am I allowed to do uh, to my own accord or do I need your approval or whatever? And a lot of people, as I was saying earlier about confidence, don't have the confidence to ask what the boundary is. Uh -huh. What's the guardrail? So they make it up in their head. They believe whatever their internal dialogue tells them. And that becomes the truth, which is an assumption that they never check or confirm if it, that assumption is true or not. I find that very fascinating. Huh. So in those, in those cases, uh, as you're, you know, coaching a leader through something like that, like what is, what does that look like, you know, on the way out? Like, uh, what, are you, do you, what am I trying to ask here? <laughs> what, 
what is that? What is that? What is that? Co- what does the coaching process look like around that? Right? Because because the, they're you're essentially saying that you've created your own constraints here. They may or may not be true. What does the coaching around that look like? Do you have them check and see what the actual constraints are? Yeah, I mean, it, it usually starts with the story, right? They're sharing the story, mm-hmm. and for whatever reason, I'm clued in or they admit that this is an unconfirmed story, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So they tell the story, whether they say it directly or I pick up one, it's like, is this story true? Yeah. And we dig in, right? Is it true because I said it's true? Right. Is it true because I have enough experience seeing it true for other people? Or do I have hard, firm confirmation from whoever the decision maker is? Yeah. Uh, once that's uncovered and we know the answer to that second bit, those three questions, right, then we could decide what the go forward is, right? Some people may still acknowledge it's an assumption uh-huh. and will not get confirmation. They'd rather live with the assumption, uh-huh. which I am baffled by. But as you asked the question about coaching, it's digging into why. Uh, well, I think if stories that we've carried around since childhood, man, those are those are comfortable stories. Yes, they are. Whether they're yes, self-limiting they or not. <laughs> Very much so. They they're meant to keep us safe. Yeah. You know, and at some point, whenever the story taking on what you're saying of childhood, it's mm-hmm. usually to keep the child safe. Mm-hmm. And then when we become adults, a lot of times those safety measures as a child are no longer relevant or even serving us as adults. Mm-hmm but we don't know how to let them go. Mm-hmm. And sometimes that's the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, and digging, digging through that stuff, man, it's, it is never easy. Um, no. I had, I had, I had a lot of, uh, I had a lot of interesting stories about fatherhood um, before I, so I've got a, a little baby girl. She's 16 months old. Um, before she was born, I did a lot of work around fatherhood because my father was not there when I was growing up. Um, and the story that I was told as a child, uh, was that he told my mother have an abortion or I'm leaving and my mother would not have the abortion. So he wasn't there. Um, so man, yeah, did I have some stories about fatherhood as I was about to become a father? And that was, uh, that was rough. It was a lot of work, uh, digging through that stuff and changing that story. So I can see how a lot of people would want to just be comfortable with their story, you know, no matter how shitty it is or self-limiting it is or whatever. Um, I mean, when you're coaching someone through stuff like that, are you, so you're a leadership coach primarily. Is one of your dirty is one of your dirty little secrets that you're also a a, a life coach? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. Like I never I never had a negative connection to the life coach moniker, mm-hmm. but some people do. Um, you know, I often joke like this. I tell people if I tell you I'm a career coach, you tell me you're not looking for a job. If I tell you I'm an executive coach, you say I'm not a C level person. If I happen to tell you I'm a life coach, you're going to scoff at me and say, you figured out life. You're going to tell me. Uh And that's how I landed a leadership coach. Uh Um, What I tell people a lot is my corporate career was built in human resources. And it's all the things I said earlier, right? Hiring and firing, cross performance management, yada, yada, yada. My coaching education is rooted in life coaching methodologies. Mm -hmm. So what I like to believe is one of my value propositions is I get to marry these two things together. And what I tell my clients is whatever you want to bring to the table, we can talk through it and I can handle it. I may not be great at all these elements, right? There's certain, some clients that bring some stuff and I'm like, wow, I feel really ill-prepared. But generally speaking, people at times will bring up marital challenges, parental challenges, insecurity issues, uh, fears, right? Things that are certain related, certainly related to their career and their job, but not apples to apples. It, it's related to the person, yeah, right? Which is the professional and the parent and the things and all the stuff, right? So the stronger we are as people, the better we are as professionals and all the other walks of life we play. So sure. the answer to your question is yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think I agree with that. The, the idea of, of comparts, like somehow magically compartmentalizing, here's my professional persona. Here's who I am at home. Yeah, I don't, I just don't buy into that. Um, I mean, 
I guess you can do that maybe if you're, you know, uh, an entertainer, right? If you're on, if you're literally on stage for a living, but even then, um, you know, it's a little, I don't know. I think I, I feel like it's, that's difficult stuff. Um, so for whatever. I fully that agree. Be. And I say not verbatim, but I talk about this. I, I don't think we as humans are great at compartmentalizing. Yeah. I think we can do it in doses. Sure. There are some people that I am sure are phenomenal at it. Most people I, I talk to work with and friends with my family, like all these people are really not very good at it. Yeah. Right. At some point, well, not even at some point. I mean, I'll just make it personal, right? If my girlfriend, Rachel and I have been together for seven years now, if we're having a fight or a disagreement, man, that's on my mind all day long, mm -hmm. right? Like, can I still be focused with you and, and do my job effectively? Yes. But that noise, that little tinkle or whatever you want to call it is back there yeah. and it doesn't turn itself off until it's resolved. Yeah. And I think that's true for most people that I talk to. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, it um, it harkens back. It reminds me of, of the saying, you probably heard this before, how you do one thing is how you do anything. How you do anything is how you do everything. Um, and, and the idea, you know, yeah, you can't really compartmentalize that, you know, how you do stuff on your personal time is how you're going to do stuff in your professional time. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean, it, it, it lends itself. There's two things I want to share. The first is what you're describing lends itself to, uh, what's called behavioral style interviewing. Uh -huh. And the, the concept of this is that how you behaved in the past, i.e. how you acted or how you solved a problem in the past is how you'll do it in the future. Uh -huh. And so a lot of companies will ask questions like, tell me a time when, uh -huh. right? Tell me a time when you overcame the same challenge that we have here. Tell me a time when you work with a different, difficult personality or whatever the tell me a time when is. Yeah. And what the interviewer is looking for is a specific story when you did the thing, <laughs> uh, right? That's, I mean, that's the whole premise of it. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that came up for me, that's not exactly apples to apples, um, is this saying, I, I think a lot of us know the saying, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Huh? And I like that saying, and I think there's an even better one, which is there is what I say and what I mean and what you hear and what you make it mean. Mm, I like that. And I like how there's ownership on both sides. Uh huh. Because as silly as this example sounds, this is a true example. I've had people tell me that, you know, as Michael walks into the office and says, Hey, Darren, how you doing? I'm like, I'm good, Michael. And then I walk away and be like, that Michael is such a phony, right? Like you're, <laughs> you're genuinely asking how I'm doing sure, and I'm making it mean that you're full of it and you have no care of how I'm doing. Sure. Yeah. I find it fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, uh, this is, you know, this is the stuff that causes wars. <laughs> 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 everything like experience experiential well experiences themselves innately are are subjective right everybody you you and i could go through the exact same thing when we were seven years old and it means something different to you today than it does to me today and it was the exact same situation right so it's yeah the the, the subjectivity of of experiences um you know it, it does uh I mean, dude, we could wax philosophical about this for, for, for ages, talking about truth and, and reality and what that means. Who knows? <laughs> yes, agreed. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, but you, you got you got to proceed in, in, in ways that make sense for you. Uh -huh. And yeah, to your point, it's like all the things that make you color your lenses of life, all the things that make me color my lenses of life, right? Uh -huh. um, so that's just a statement. Um the experiential, the subjectivity of experience is straight up, no doubt. And kind of going back to what we were saying earlier about the assumptive nature of things mm -hmm. is that so many people in my personal and professional life, me included, proceed without getting enough clarity on whatever the thing is. Uh -huh. And then my reality is X and your reality is Y. And we never agreed to whatever the thing was, uh -huh. right? We never got clarity on where we're going to dinner or how we're going to solve this work problem, or I'm going to do the PowerPoint, but you're going to make it pretty or whatever the story is. And then we walk around with these assumptions and then shit goes haywire. And next thing you know, it's like, well, that Michael didn't do it. And it's like, well, did you ask him? Did you, did you confirm the assumption? Mm -hmm. And um, 
anyway, I may have lost my train of thought, but this subjective nature, I just, it's so, it's so prevalent. How important is the act of setting expectations? Oh my God. It's, it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what comes out of my mouth a lot with some of the people I coach is when you're a leader and what's being carried out or the message that are being um, communicated below you, if they're not to what you expected, then it's on you. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to, there's what I say and what I mean, what you hear and what you make it mean. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Two is, were you clear enough? And this is tied to it. Did you ask the person how they heard what you said? Mm -hmm. Right? So I could ask you to mow the lawn, but if I don't tell you to do it, you know, with vertical lines as opposed to horizontal lines or diagonal lines, right? Like I didn't yeah. set the expectation other than mowing the lawn. Yeah. And if you mow the lawn in circles, am I annoyed with you because you did that? Well, I didn't set a clear enough expectation. So maybe a silly example, but yes, there's yeah. too much lack of clarity and too much assumption that then results in things going sideways. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I like to uh, mow my lawn in, in, lawn in a, in a check. Check. Hey, of course you're Pacheco. Of course yeah. you do. Uh, awesome, man. Um, let's see. Let's see. What, what, what three books would you recommend all of your clients read today, this year? Oh, in 2023? Man. Um, can I do four just because? Absolutely. All right. Uh, I mentioned, well, I think I mentioned earlier, positive intelligence, maybe I didn't. Positive intelligence is a practice that I'm very much uh, embedded with and I'm in love with it. So the book is foundational for me. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have clients read excerpts from it regularly. Uh, two is, I love Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. I know it's an older book now, but it's just a really good sound read that I think is actionable and action's big for me. Um, for... Leaders who are having troubles with accountability and getting things done. I love Patrick Lencioni's five behaviors of a, of a cohesive team. Mm -hmm. uh, you have it. Uh, you're looking. <laughs> I've got well, I've got ideal team player. All right, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> right. I like the way the dude writes and, and his stuff is easy to, to digest and it makes sense for me. Yeah. Um, and then the last book that um, is really foundational to the leadership framework that I like to subscribe to. It's called the leadership challenge. Okay. And for a lot of leaders that I work with, they, they just lead by doing what they do mm -hmm. and they don't have a framework. I don't want to say they don't have thought because they have thought, but maybe it's not deliberate or they don't have a, a picture of a framework in their brain of how they lead. Mm -hmm. And the leadership challenge is a very simple uh, framework that I love. And it's got a whole bunch of exercises and a book and a, an assessment and yada, yada. So that's, that's my other one. I really like that book. Nice. I am not familiar with that one. I'll have to check that out. Yeah. Read the cliff notes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Um, well, sweet Darren, is there, man, is there anything else that, that you would like to talk about that we didn't get an opportunity to touch upon? Oh man. Great question. Um, you know, something that's been thematic with a few clients lately has yeah. been around this, well, not this, but around the topic of happiness. And mm -hmm. I would put satisfaction and fulfillment into that same bucket. But in essence, some of my clients are just not happy. And what I find with some of them, at least, is that they're very much leaning into their professional persona at the expense of their personal persona. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say it's obvious because in, in, in the throes of each person's life, it's not so obvious as I'm communicating it, mm -hmm. but maybe the thing just to touch upon is if anybody is listening, that is feeling any sense of unhappiness. Um, I think it's important to take stock of what we're doing, how we're showing up, uh, are we leaning into both personas equally one more than the other? And I think ultimately is, are we embracing the people we are, right? The sons, the daughters, the moms, the dads, the brothers, the sisters, the friends, the mountain bikers, the things we do, the guitarists, right? Are we leaning into these things that generally bring us joy mm -hmm. that you might otherwise hope bring more happiness? Because that's the thing I find missing with a lot of people is they're not embracing the things that 
usually bring them happiness. I love that, man. Um, yeah, I want to, I want to triple down on that message. That's, that's a, that's a good one. So, I mean, for me, these guitars, I just pulled them out a, a couple months ago and it was far and away the most impactful thing that I did for myself, for my family and for my business in Q2. Yes. Um, because it's okay. just, they, they, they've been sitting in their cases for seven, six, seven years for, a, for reasons. I don't know, you know, <laughs> I just decided to pull them out. Um, I didn't want my daughter growing up without music, and I had completely forgotten the joy that I get from sitting around and diddling with a guitar. And it's wow. just, it, it takes me to a, a peaceful, happy, creative space. Yeah. As cheesy as it is, for those listening, I literally have a blow up microphone on my desk. And what Michael said is a mic drop. Nice. <laughs> that was awesome, man. I especially love how you made the connection to your daughter and the music, yeah. how you playing is not positively impacting your business, right? Yeah. Those aren't apples to apples thing, but like we were saying earlier, like the man behind you plays all the roles, Yeah. right? And if you're neglecting a certain piece that brings you great joy, like you're neglecting you and when yeah. you honor you, more of you shows up, man. I, I'm, I got chills, man. That's a great story. Yeah, that's great. I know. I appreciate it. And I think, uh, you know, I want to encourage those watching and listening too. like, I didn't know that I was missing it. Right. So you might not even realize <clears throat> that you're missing it. But yeah, man, if you're feeling some kind of malaise or just generally unhappy, you know, if there's something that you used to love, try doing it again. Um, or, or just, you know, try stuff, try stuff. Right. Go go karting. Who knows? Maybe you love it. I don't know, right? Like, just try different things, man. Um, and, and you know, find something that just lights you up and makes you feel good. If it ain't light, it ain't right. I love it. Love it. <laughs> um, sweet, man. Darren Canthal, thank you so much, brother. I appreciate you making time to be uh, back on the podcast again and kind of catch up with me. Thank you for having me. I appreciate that. It's good to see Where you. Real quick before we leave, uh, where can our listeners and viewers connect with you online? Um, two best places. First is LinkedIn. Uh, I am, last time I checked, which is not that long ago, I'm the only Darren Canthal on LinkedIn. So I, I have that, uh, whatever, I have that. Uh, <laughs> distinction. And then, yeah, distinction. Thank you. My brain wasn't working on the word. Uh, and my website is The Canthal Group. So those are the two best places to find me. Love it. Thank you, man. And thank you to our viewers and listeners. You guys are fantastic. Without you, this show is nothing. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see all of you next time.